My sermon will reference a number of Proverbs, so you might want to keep your bulletin in that uh, book of sayings. Verse 32 says, Better a patient person than a warrior, one with self-control than one who takes a city. Earlier, the young people passed out marshmallows. I noticed that some of them were very enticed by it, begging me to let them eat it right then. I found at the early service that most of the adults were not quite as enticed, that some of them left with big handfuls of these. They didn't want them getting ground into the cushions, but just smell it right now. Hmm. Doesn't it smell like pure sugar? Mm. Most of us really don't want a marshmallow. We want to roast it, you know, put it between some graham cracker with some, uh, you know, a chocolate bar. Then you have a s'more. That, that's nice. But just a, a raw marshmallow. How many of you would be enticed to eat this right now? All right. I see two hands go up. And some of them are pretty young. Yeah. Most of us, though, could resist. But back in the 1960s, there was a scientist. He wanted to explore why we want things like this. His name was Walter Mischel. And his test was called the marshmallow test. And it became very influential in uh, psychological circles. The subjects of this experiment were four-year-olds that were at the preschool at Stanford University. The object was to assess their ability to delay gratification. Could they put off something they really wanted now if they might get something better in the future? So each child was given one marshmallow. And the researcher said, if you want, you can eat this right now. Or if you wait till I come back in the room, I'll give you an extra marshmallow, and you'll have two marshmallows. But you can't eat this one if you want that extra one. And then he would leave the room and actually go behind a one-way mirror so he could watch the reaction of the kids. And he found that one-third of the kids would usually scarf it down immediately. But all the others would kind of stare at that marshmallow in front of them. Some of them would start singing songs or try to sleep or talk to some of the others that did anything to distract themselves from that marshmallow that was sitting there that marshmallow with their name on it. Once again, about a third of the kids, by the end of that 15 minutes, they caved in. They gobbled down that marshmallow. The remaining third, when the doctor came back in, he re rewarded them with a extra marshmallow. Now, the experiment really didn't stop there because what he wanted to know was, as these kids, you know, show some of their characteristics when they're young, what happens when they're older? So he took those same kids, as teenagers and did more experiments on them. He did a bunch of psychological tests, didn't give them a marshmallow this time, but did a bunch of tests. And what he found was amazing. He said that those who had been able to control their impulses when they were young and delay, delay their gratification were more effective socially and personally as teenagers. They had higher levels of assertiveness, self-confidence, dependability, and a superior ability to control stress. And what's even more remarkable, they gave them each SAT scores because most of them were ready to go on to college at that point. And they found that the waiters, the ones that were able to resist for 15 minutes that temptation, had a score 210 points higher than the ones who were the grabbers and took it right away. Well, Dr. Mitchell concluded that the ability to control yourself and to delay gratification turns children into successful adults. Confucius wrote many centuries ago, the nature of people is always the same. It is their habits that separate them. You know, they did another uh, little experiment and some research, and they found that an individual's IQ accounts for about one-third of your academic performance. So if you're a smart kid, you know, you can expect to get to a certain level. But two-thirds of your performance is due to discipline, perseverance, hard work, creativity, and luck. Now, you can't control luck, but you can learn to control yourself. How well are you doing at it? You know, in the New Testament, Paul has a very famous passage. It's called the fruit of the Spirit, and he lists the fruit of the Spirit. If you've got the Holy Spirit in you, these qualities should be evident. Do you know what those qualities are? Say it louder. All right, which one comes last? Self-control. Why does it come last? No one knows. It could be 
because it's the pinnacle. That's the final point you reach. But it could also be because it's the hardest. It's the last one you can acquire because all the other ones fall into place a lot easier. Uh, all I know is that self-control comes easier for some people, but anybody can acquire it with God's help. Now, you all have delayed eating your marshmallow. Uh, one of the kids could not. He begged me to let him have it right then. But if you were four years old, which group do you think you'd be in? You think you'd gobble it right away? Would you have tried to wait but gobble it anyway? Or would you have lasted to the bitter end? Well, no human has perfect self-control, except for Jesus. Jesus, you know, he would be able to control himself. But the rest of us will always struggle. I myself, I see myself as a pretty disciplined guy. You know, I've always been a good student, and there's things in life I can really, you know, apply myself to. But I have other areas that I struggle in that I'm much more temptable. Most of you are probably about the same. But if you can't get a handle on it, if you lack self-control, it can be devastating. Proverbs 25, 28, it also talks about self-control. And it says, if you don't have self-control, you're like a city that doesn't have a wall, which means that anything that wants to attack you can come in and take you down. But then what does Proverbs 16, 32 say? If you do have self-control, you're better than being a conquering warrior. Nothing can stand in your way. And I don't know about you, I'd rather be in that second category. Self-control is not that difficult to comprehend. It just means you're controlling your actions, your emotions, uh, the thoughts, so that you can make wise choices in life. And if you gain self-control, it takes some work, but it will last a lifetime. One leadership expert said that self-control, when you're young, is choosing to get something you want by doing something you don't want to do. For example, homework. Did any of you ever do homework when you were in school? They say some schools are like outlawing it now, so it's just, you know, playtime all the time. But when I was a kid, you had a lot of homework. And I didn't like doing homework. I wanted to do other things. But your mom makes you do it. The teachers make you do it. And as you do it consistently, it becomes easier. You actually enjoy it after a while. And you end up being able to graduate and get a job, and you don't starve to death. So it has a very practical function to it. But you have to apply yourself to it at first. And so when you're young and you do it consistently, it becomes a habit. And habits really mold you. It's hard work, but you benefit from it. And it's really all a matter of discipline. You're kind of deciding what kind of person do I want to be? And what do I need to do to arrive there? Well, the book of Proverbs, as well as the rest of the Bible, has quite a few passages on self-control. And I want to talk about some of those areas that it covers. One would be romantic relationships which is just a more pastoral way to say sex, right? Proverbs 6.26, For a prostitute can be had for a loaf of bread, but another man's wife preys on your very life. Now, sex is actually a good thing. God created it. And I can say with all these little grandchildren being born, sex is amazing. I mean, I look at my son that my wife gave birth to, and he married a beautiful young woman. They now have a little boy and a little girl which is, you know, I get to visit them when I choose and have as much fun as I want. And I don't know what kind of personality she's going to have. I don't know exactly what she's going to look like, but it's going to be amazing to watch them develop. And it's all because of that miraculous thing called sex. But I also know of individuals, friends, and sometimes neighbors who have destroyed their lives because they couldn't control sex. They end up with someone who's not good for them, they end up with lots of, you know, problems and responsibilities they weren't anticipating. It's all because they weren't disciplined in that area. And Jesus says it's not enough to control your actions. you got to think about your mind, your thought process in all of this. How controlled are you in this whole realm? How controlled are you in the area of romance and, and physical sex? Is it something that you've got a handle on or has it got a handle on you? Another area, money. Proverbs 21.20 says, The wise store up choice food and olive oil, but fools gulp theirs down. And that sounds just like the whole uh, marshmallow test. You know, they just want it immediately. Well, Proverbs 6.6 6 talks about ants, how you need to study the habits of ants. They're dumb little creatures, and yet together 
They store for the future. They plan ahead. And so they're very diligent. He says, we're supposed to be like ants. And I, I can see the wisdom of it, especially as I'm approaching retirement. I'm so glad that when I was a very young pastor, we started putting away very methodically the same amount every year. Then we would start increasing it. Uh, I met someone this week who said that whenever she gets a raise, she takes like half of it and puts it in her 401k. So she never even misses it from the very beginning. And someday over a long haul, you know, she'll be able to retire. Well, that's how you kind of have to be in life. You know, you have to be disciplined and think about the future, even though the future is a long way off. Ambition, Proverbs 23, 4. Don't wear yourself out to get rich. Do not trust your own cleverness. Now, that almost sounds like the opposite of a work ethic. You know, just like goof off some or something. But really what it's saying is too much area or too much discipline in a very narrow era area makes you unbalanced in life. I know people who love to work. They love to accumulate money, but they're workaholics. They don't have time for their family. They don't have time to relax. These are the people who work so hard to the day they're going to retire, and then they drop dead. You want a life that's got the balance in it, that you have lots of good things, whether it's work, relaxation, your family, and your faith. You need to have time and effort in all those areas. Another area, alcohol. Proverbs 23, 29. Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has strife? Who has complaints? Who has needless bruises? Who has bloodshot eyes? Those who linger over wine. Alcohol has similarities to spirituality. The Bible even makes that connection. It can make you feel peaceful. It can make you act weird. Uh, and so many people are seeking to have those deeper feelings in life. And right now, uh, I know in our state very soon will probably be legal to uh, smoke dope, you know, and not get arrested for it, uh, as long as it's, you know, for your personal use. And the whole world is seeking to get high. And I know there's many people in our church and give a testimony about how when they were young, you know, they went after it all the time. Maybe some of them still are going after it all the time. You just want to have that high feeling. And someone shared with me in a Sunday school class that uh, she had, you know, had that kind of experience. And she says that most of my friends, it's like we had an emptiness in us. You want to fill it with something. And so you fill it with that. But the problem is that wears off so quickly. You still got that hole in your bucket. Everything is draining out. So what's the Bible say? If you know God, you'll have that feeling fulfilled, a purpose in life. And we're all running after the artificial stuff. We're missing the stuff that truly is meaningful. I can walk around my yard right now. I got tulips coming up and daffodils are, you know, kind of going past. There's still some of them blooming. There's just things that can make your soul just go, ah, I don't need something artificial. God's already given us what we need. And anything that really makes you lose control of yourself, you need to stay away from that. You know, the Bible, some people can argue, it says you can use alcohol moderately. Some say, no, you've got to totally abstain. But everyone agrees, if it makes you lose control, it's wrong. Always have a handle on your life and your actions. A fifth area, your temper. Proverbs 29, 11, Fools give full vent to their rage, but the wise bring calm in the end. Uh, I thought of that because yesterday um, someone in the church was supposed to or thought that they could pick up uh, Glenn Meyer at the hospital but the last minute they realized they had a conflict so they asked if I could do it. That's a dangerous thing but I did. I went to the hospital. I picked up Glenn. There was heavy traffic on the way home and there's a person in front of me this is like on Route 287 they slowed down to like a stop because they wanted to get over to the next lane and I don't swear. I, don't, I didn't but I said Hey, Buster, move it, you know, get over there. And Glenn notices, of course. I said, well, you know, at least I didn't pull a baseball bat or something out like that. You know, we all, we feel that tension in life. You know, we all get kind of irritated. But only a fool just lets it all out. If you're a controlled person, maybe you have some choice words, but you just realize the traffic's going to move eventually. We're going to get going. You know, some things in life you do need to stifle. Rage is never helpful. And what's the Proverbs 15, 1 say? A gentle answer turns away wrath. Always choose the, the nice way, the calm way. Control your rages or it's going to get the best of you. And I know people that have destroyed relationships 
and have a lot of grief in life because they can't keep those emotions under check. Personal discipline is a constant struggle. Even when you think you've arrived and you've got a handle on it, you don't. Scientists say if you think you're pretty good at resisting temptation, chances are you are mistaken. They've done lots of tests on this, and um, Lauren Nordgren of the Kellogg School of Management says, people are not good at anticipating the power of their urges, and those who are the most confident about their self-control are the most likely to give in to temptation. Now, I'll admit there's some areas where I am weak when it comes to temptation. Those marshmallows I passed out, I knew I had to get some extra, so I went down to Walmart last night, late last night, like half an hour before Walmart closed, and I bought a great big bag of those marshmallows. I also was in that aisle, so I might as well get a box of gobstoppers and one of those uh, Snickers. It comes in that long thing, has all the little individual things, because if you're eating an individual Snicker, that's just like a little snack. Of course, when you're eating four of them, it's just like having the whole big uh, thing, and I am susceptible to that. My wife looks in our pantry, and she says, David you're supposed to be dieting you're defeating yourself and i say amen i know i'm doing it and it's because i'm going there to do something that's important and necessary but my eye wanders some of the stuff nearby we all have those weaknesses and you have to decide what your weakness is and find a way to build strength against it now we all have some realities we have to acknowledge for example biology you're created a certain way. Everyone has different weaknesses and different strengths. You are what you are, but that's no excuse for always caving in. You need to learn to counterbalance what your natural uh, state. You also have a family background. Maybe your family messed you up. You may have had a really dysfunctional family. That explains a lot of things you do, but it's no excuse. You can overcome that with effort. Your friends have an impact. The Bible says bad company corrects good character there is bad company all around you may find some of them in church some of the worst habits you've ever learned you may have gotten from another church person it happens you know because wickedness is everywhere we're all sinners but you need to seek out people who build you up whether it's in this church or anywhere else you need to be encouraged by them and maybe they're people that have failed maybe like you go to an aa meeting and there's people that have had worse problems you've had but they've overcome them Find out who they are and stick by them so you will get strength as well. You need to be accountable to someone who's strong. I shouldn't buy marshmallows by myself. I should take one of you with me. But then maybe the time will come when I can help someone who is weak. We all need to help each other in this. And we need to learn to lean on God. Self-control doesn't mean it's just you. Galatians uh, 5.22, which talks about the fruit of the Spirit, it says at the end of that that this can only come from belonging to Christ. We need a relationship with him. And it says that we also have to crucify our sinful nature daily. You are bent in the wrong way. You need help in getting straight. So you need to seek God all the time to learn what God expects you, how he expects you to live. And then choose that path every hour. When you're tempted, you need to pray. When you're strong, you still need to pray. And in the end, it will make a difference. Undisciplined people pay a steep price. They miss great opportunities. They squander what might have been. They often end up just regretting so many of the choices they made in life. Well, what kind of person are you going to be? Not just now, but into the future. Analyze where you're weak and start changing it now. Be intentional about it and do it with God's help. And you'll see that he has remarkable plans for you. As Jesus himself said, I've come that you might have life and have it abundantly. Learn how to make those choices that make that abundant life happen. Let's bow our heads. Our Heavenly Father, we all have our weaknesses. And there are probably some in this congregation who have seen lives torn apart by choices that weak people have made. Maybe it's even happened to us. But we know, Lord, that no matter how far we fall, we can still turn around because God can do miracles. He can take lousy situations and make it into a positive lesson for us. But help us, Lord, to learn, to apply it, to become someone different than what we are now. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.